So, Caroline, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so, what do you understand by new public management and what's your link with it? Well, new public management is um, a sort of collection of uh, ideas and initiatives that started probably under Margaret Thatcher and continue to this day. And it's really about bringing in uh, business management techniques into the into the into the business of uh, public management. It's about uh, and it's, it's, it's you know there's, over the years there have been a number of different manifestations of this, all of which will be very familiar. Uh, to people listening to this because they have become sort of second nature. But uh, when they first arrived, they were all extraordinarily new and, and a very different way of doing things. And it started, I suppose, with um, Margaret Thatcher trying to uh, ensure that everybody in the civil service had a budget and managed that budget efficiently and aligned it to the tasks that they were trying to do. And then it, it, it sort of evolved uh, into creating um, business units, businesses, mini businesses inside governments, which until that time had just been sort of one um, amorphous whole. Um, then, you know, she wanted, um, well, she, she she brought in somebody called uh, Sir Derek Rayner, who ran Marks and Spencers improbably, uh, to look at government. And he, you know, insisted that she set up these new businesses within government. So that was a, another dimension. And, um, it, you know, it then evolved into um, creating internal markets inside the public sector, for example, inside the NHS, you know, purchaser provider split. Uh, it also involved uh, outsourcing of functions, which formerly had been done by um, the public sector to the private sector and, and increasingly to the voluntary sector as well, delivering public services. Privatisation of whole swathes uh, under Margaret Thatcher of uh, what was the public sector and um, moving towards a very different way of thinking about how you get results so you know this involves setting targets for every part of the public sector to deliver against and moving to competitive tendering to uh try and find the, the cheapest possible way of delivering against those targets i mean those are just a kind of a list if you like of some of the things that have happened um but that the the underlying philosophy is that actually government is a business public services are businesses and you need to put business disciplines in and, and market, you know, competition into them in order to make them much more effective. Thank you. And um, could you please tell us uh, who are you and what were you doing at the time that new public management started to develop? Well, uh, my name is Caroline Slowcock and I'm the Director of Civil Exchange and also the, the co-founder of a leadership network called A Better Way, which is cross-sectoral and trying to improve public services and strengthen community and uh, create a fairer society. Um, in 1982, I joined the civil service and it, precisely at that moment, uh, the first um, instrument of new public management was, was put in place by... Um, Michael Heseltine, who was a, a a businessman, who was also a government minister working for Margaret Thatcher, and it was called um, the Financial Management Initiative, and it meant that every whatever you're doing, and at this particular point, I was um, working in a, a very tiny team, about five people, um, uh, taking forward some legislation, drafting the legislation um, on industrial relations and the Department of Employment. And what we had to do, um, which actually seemed quite ludicrous at the time, was we had to set up a little mini budget for these five people. And we had to manage that budget, even though that you know, that, that really wasn't our kind of core strength. Uh, and it was a really tiny budget with almost no um, opportunity to find efficiencies. And I remember distinctly having to put forward a, a business case for my first computer, I think it was the first computer in that part of government. I was put forward a business case for this Amstrad to prove that it would save money by um, re reducing the number of uh, typists that would be needed in the civil service. And that was just a sort of illustration of, of you know, the kind of uh, the way in which I first came across this. But it was also a big cultural change for the civil service, which basically saw itself as doing policy 
And I, what, what the government was trying to say is, no, you're, you're, you're doing management and managing money is just as important as um, delivering policy and giving advice to ministers. The um, second way in which I became involved in uh, new public management was really very directly where um, Margaret Thatcher had set up a review um, called the uh, Next Steps Review, uh, led by um, the chairman of Marks and Spencers, which said that we should um, establish new businesses, business units inside government. And I went to the cabinet office as part of a five person team to um, take on the whole of the civil service, really, um, and persuade them uh, that they should fundamentally shift the way that they were doing business. So I was responsible uh, as a, it's really a very young civil servant, probably about 32, um, with talking to the Department of uh, um, Health and Social Security about setting up the benefit service um, as a uh, next steps agency and also the prison service and the passport office. And, you know, we now take it for granted that these are relatively um, separate uh, management units. Um, but that was actually a, a huge step breaking up the civil service as we knew it then. Um, but the next and the next thing that I was di very directly involved in again, which is um, possibly more uh, at the top of people's minds in relation to new public management, was that I was working in the Treasury for Gordon Brown, who was the incoming chancellor when Labour came to power in 1997. And he wanted to change, it was part of his public sector reforms, he wanted to change the way in which um, public services were delivered. And the Labour had this concept of something for something. If you give extra money to public services, then you should get something back. So it's sort of contractual. And um, what they what they introduced was, which I put in place, was um, public service agreements. This was the sort of contract. And they set out the, um, the, the specific targets which each government department would need to deliver uh, in order to get the extra money that they, that they was trying to inject into the system. Um, so I was at the forefront of those targets, which nowadays many people who work in the public sector find so irksome. Um, but I could I could talk at some length about that process and its flaws. But the biggest single flaw to my mind was uh, that there was no real discussion with those who were actually delivering the targets about what the target should be. Um, so that was my experience when I was in government. When I moved out of government, I uh, became the chief executive of a charity that was uh, effectively delivering services for the government. And uh, during that time, competitive tendering was introduced, uh, linked to delivery of targets. And what I could see very clearly being on the receiving end of competitive tendering was how crude an instrument it was really for getting value for money. And the whole process was farmed out to subcontractors who had some really kind of simplistic uh, indicators of value. And the, the first exercise which was run uh, had to be completely ditched because um, you know it produced utter nonsense. Um, you know, and there, even I think the department itself recognised that uh, it you know hadn't worked. But it was an illustration really of how you can sit in the centre of government and dream up these ideas of how you can make things more efficient, but actually they have deep unintended consequences. And I think that where we're moving to is some of the implications of new public management and coming towards the way that government operates at the moment and the civil servants, civil service operates. One question that I just have is, in the very beginning of new public management, what knowledge do you have about how that started and the um, some of the experiences that you had when that when the whole thing was being collated and made into something? Well, I think um, you know if you look at the very big picture, this is really. Uh, about 
Margaret Thatcher's view of the world. Uh, her view was that business uh, was the, the the driver of innovation and value in society, and that the only way to create value in the public sector was to behave like a business. And, you know, the way the civil service and the public sector saw itself before then was was probably much more values orientated. Uh, it was probably much more to do with quality and less to do with results. And, you know, there was some truth in the fact that, uh, you know, that could become self-serving. And so, you know, I think she, the, the other great driver for her was the view that taxpayers' money had to be well spent. And uh, the state was too large. So she wanted to, to to try and make sure that the taxpayer was getting a good deal. And her way of thinking was very much about the taxpayer. And, you know, she, she produced an most enormous change through Britain, much of it, to my mind, not positive, but she was um, creating a, a drive to shift the economy towards um, a, a much more sort of uh, financial services and consumer services uh, orientation, uh, which took off in London and the Southeast, but didn't actually bring wealth to much of you know, other parts of Britain. And uh, one of my tasks was to go out with her, and I was there in her last 18 months. I was there right at the end of her her uh, regime, her 11 and a half years. And I vividly remember visiting Ely Cathedral. And uh, the reason she was going there was because new windows had been installed, which were sponsored, uh, visibly sponsored, by um, John Lewis and... Um, just trying to remember the other business. I think Marks and Spencers, just trying to remember. I've got it written down. Oh, Tesco's. Tesco's, of course. Tesco's and John Lewis. The Tesco's and John Lewis windows in Ely Cathedral. And it's in a way, it's a sort of um, beautiful kind of uh, symbol. Or uh, Beautiful perhaps isn't the right word. It's a terrible symbol <laughs> of um, Thatcher's Britain and what she was trying to do, you know, to bring business into every kind of sphere of life. And... Um, I worked for John Major as well, um, briefly as as a private secretary, but also obviously subsequently I was working in the Treasury. And um, he created something called the Citizens' Charter, which was an attempt, I think, to give new consumer rights to, uh, to, to everybody who used public services. So he was trying to set some standards so that people, people who were using public servants, uh, uh, public services, you know, got a better deal. But um, that too was a quite a profound shift because it was it was moving towards the idea of um, the taxpayers as consumers of services. So those I think were the two sort of fundamental ideas which have shaped what followed. But um, surprisingly, in a way, given that it was such a massive change in the way that in which. Um, the public service as seen and works, it actually stuck with the incoming Labour government who, you know, went on to do even more, um, you know, as I was explaining earlier, and as well as introducing public service agreements and targets, they also uh, created, you know, they built on foundations laid by the Conservatives and created um, NHS trusts and school academies uh, little business units, if you like, inside a, a kind of wider um, service. And, um, you know, these are now second nature to us, but they are, you know, they, they weren't there, you know, when I joined the civil service in 1982. All of this is is, is down to political will. Um, it's a trend which has been taken up by other countries. And so it's even been, been further normalised. But it is, it is, you know, it is. Um, it was a conscious shift, and it would be possible to make another conscious shift uh, of equal magnitude, were our politicians wishing to do so. 
Well, that that's interesting because as you were saying this, uh, I'm trying to put myself back at that time. There must have been uh, enormous uh, enthusiasm in that small group that was developing this. And um, you must have seen something momentous growing and developing. And that actually, from Margaret Thatcher's perspective, that must have been a very courageous thing to do in her position. Uh, yes, it was a big shift. And I, I actually had some enthusiasm, certainly for the Next Steps initiative, which was trying to create more outward facing parts of government facing towards the people who were using those services and more efficient and more accountable. I had a lot of um, sympathy with that personally. And so I was I saw this as a very important way of actually modernizing um, services so that they work better for the people that they ultimately served. And the, the, the civil service model, and I, I was entering as a fast stream civil servant, so a sort of trainee Mandarin, if you like, you know, I was expected to be, you know, um, working alongside and closely with ministers. Uh, you know, so, you know, that's, that was my focus initially. But, um, you know, bear in mind, it was about half a million people, many of whom actually had very little, if nothing at all to do with, uh, with ministers. But we're still sort of focusing, looking upwards towards what they were doing and saying, rather than looking downwards, um, as, as would have been seen in that sort of those hierarchical days, looking downwards to the people that they were there to provide a service for. So, you know, some of these trends were, I think, actually a good thing. But, you know, you have to sort of uh, look look ahead and see what it actually happened. And I think that, uh, you know, this, a lot of these reforms were counterproductive, even if they were designed to be improvements. Now, that, that's fascinating. I think um, getting a little bit of an understanding of what it must must have been like on, on the edge of such a huge change. Uh, what was the response from the civil service when they had to, um, I suppose, conform to this? I think a, a lot of civil servants felt that it was um, it was wrong headed, you know, and uh, um, were quite attached to the way that they were currently doing things. Um, so I think that you know it was it was very much against the culture, and uh, certainly Whitehall was not keen on setting up business units initially. Though you know, since then these business units have become just a complete norm and you know uh, but I think probably they felt that it was moving the deck chairs you know on the Titanic rather than actually doing something of substance but I think it did have a big cultural shift for certain areas though there are still problems you know the passport office is mm. for example you know it is an office now it is it is, it is a next step a, next steps agency but it still has problems mm. thank you that 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 was fascinating um and the fact that that this happened then, I'm getting an impression from you that it's been changed and modified over the years. Do we still have it today? Yes, I think new public management, you know, in its many dimensions, is everywhere. Uh, absolutely everywhere, not just actually in the public sector. You know, it's 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 uh, it's shifted the way in which uh, civil service operates. It's shifted the way in which the public sector is operating, the NHS um, massively, um, schools. Um, but it's also affected the way in which government views its partnership with other aid, with other bodies that are delivering public services for them. So instead of that being seen as a partnership, it's seen as a contractual relationship. It's 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 subtly but profoundly changed the nature of the relationship between governments and those organisations with whom whom it works. And if you sort of step back and think, well, um, what is government really about? You know, what is it for? Um, it's it's about achieving often social goals that. Government alone, and even with its many agencies, you know, like the NHS, just simply cannot deliver alone. And it's not about services, not just about services. Uh, it's also about um, behaviours. 
So, for example, you know, health um, is produced not just by the NHS. In fact, the NHS is, you know, probably you know, has a, a function in, in, in good health, health checks, vaccinations and so forth. But, you know, it's only a very small part of that. You know, a lot of it is about uh, um, good lives, you know, poverty, um, uh, you know, health promotion. It's about healthy places in which people can live. Um, you know, it's it, it, and it involves you know, schools, but it also involves charities. It involves businesses. You know, we're all involved in the business of health uh, in this country. But if you start to turn your key relationships into simple contractual relationships based around the delivery of very narrow service delivery targets, then you stop getting the advice and the relationship that you need to kind of really collaborate and join forces across society to you know understand the problem and to do something about it. Uh, that's that's interesting because it's it's now coming to what we what we're learning about today and i think the question i have is it's now been many years since new public management was formed what have we learned about new public management and what do we now understand needs to change about it or other elements of new public management need to change or do we need to revisit the whole thing I think we need to revisit the whole thing. Uh, you know, I think um, you know one of the things which has become clear is that targets are gamed. You know that that uh, uh, you set a target, it will probably be delivered, but it may not. The delivery may not be actually what you expected, and other things which are perhaps equally, if not more important, will not be delivered. So you know, I think that that kind of uh, concern has has become very clear. I think it the combination of targets and tight unit costs has um, driven out value. Uh, you know, it, it 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 appears to be creating better value for the taxpayer. It appears to be more efficient, but actually, uh, often that kind of wider value that you're trying to achieve, the, the outcomes ultimately that you would like to achieve. Uh, are being shortchanged, and um, the atomization of services into different, you know, business units, um, sometimes, you know, in in a competitive way, is making it harder to kind of work across across the silos and join forces. So, um, and I think this whole idea which has become at the roots of, it is, it's the heart of new public management, which is um, that the, the government is a manager. You know, it is managing the whole of the public sector. Is is sort of, a, first of all, it's flawed. You can't sit in, in, you know, in the treasury and pull levers. And I think Gordon Brown's idea of what, what you know, government was going to be was you were sort of sitting like a sort of small person on a sort of crane pulling levers. And that this would, you know, have the consequence out there in the wider public sector. Um, and, you know, it, it, it doesn't work. Um, you know, you can't, you, it, 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 it's too, things are too remote. There are too many things that happen in between you saying do that and people doing it. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it, it's it, that sort of whole concept is flawed. But I think that's also the idea of um, government as being a public service management function is is is, is not it's, it, it's, it's out of date and it's potentially quite damaging. You know, it is true that there are public services that, you know, that, that it does run. And these are um, it's important that they are efficient. And that they are deliver results and they're accountable to the people through through ministers but um but it's also true that uh the things which we tackle we have to tackle you know like poor health which has huge social costs um or you know global warming um you know all of the big issues that we face are much more than just a delivery of a service 
you know, they are about winning over hearts and minds, and they are about, you know, looking at the system as a whole and understanding it and making sure that it works well. And it, it needs a different set of skills, really, from just simple public service management, because fundamentally, public sector really isn't like business. You know, there are some similarities, and in certain parts of the you know, that machine, um, there are units which are similar to um, businesses. They can charge for their services, for example, like the passports office does. Um, but you know, there isn't the you know it is it's a different it's a different thing. Delivering social outcomes is different to delivering commercial outcomes. And um, under David Cameron's government. Uh, Francis Maud, who was the minister for uh, cabinet office minister responsible for the civil service, changed the um, uh, the uh, competences of the civil service, senior civil service, to from delivering outcomes to delivering commercial outcomes. But this, you know, my contention, my belief um, from observation is that actually delivering outcomes, social outcomes, is not the same as commercial outcomes. And um, I think the other thing which is problematic about new public management is um, it's driven out the human elements of public services. And if you are actually in a business selling services to people, you really do look after your customers. You really do try to deliver what they want. You do listen to them. Um, but in the public sector, there isn't that incentive because you can't go out of business. And um, if, you, if your incentives are to reduce your costs and deliver a target which has been set from above, you stop listening and relating to the people that you're serving. And this is, uh, you know, this is um, a poor service. Uh, you, you get people at the front line who are form filling and box ticking, but can't do the job that they actually went there to do. And I think that's, you know, one of the most serious problems with new public management. So, uh, you know, I think that it's it's run out of road and, you know, it's been an interesting experiment. Um, there are some things which we've learned and probably some things which we should retain, like being clear about what you're trying to achieve. Um, but actually we need a very different style of uh, management in the public sector now. Okay, thank you, Caroline. Uh, that's a very insightful and, and quite deep um, analysis of what's been going on with, with the impact of new public management. Now, that's been many years since this has started, and obviously we've had a lot of time to look at the evidence and reflect. So is this type of discussion that we're having now, is this commonplace in positions of leadership in government? I think that uh, actually people are coming around to this way of thinking in some places in government and certainly in the conversations I've had with some people in local government in particular, I think that uh, people are beginning to see that there's a, there's, there's a better way of doing things. So I think there is a sort of very slow shift, but I don't know that the, you know, the, the ministers are thinking this way at all and i don't know that even the, the labor party at the point we're speaking you know we're probably a year off an election is is thinking enough about this um but i do detect a shift you know a belief that we need more relational services that we need more preventative government certainly the labor party at this point is talking about that and um that we need to do things in a different way and if that's the goal, then I think you need to start changing some of these underpinnings, which, you know, for a lot of people are quite technical, but they are so deep rooted that, you know, they're, they're just everywhere. And so it would need a, you need a really kind of fundamental shift, I think, conscious shift in another direction. Um, well, Caroline, I think that in terms of all the questions and the thoughts that I had in my head, um, I think we've covered them and you've you've explained really well um, all of that. So I don't really have anything more to say. But Caroline, thank you. That's been absolutely fascinating. It's been 
it's been really interesting to hear not just the sort of the details and the surface level of what new public management is about, but much more about what underlies it. Because what you're saying is that from the practical aspects and what we can see is one thing, but actually that's had huge implications on behaviors and the way that decisions are made and the relationship between the public sector and citizens. So thank you.